Now may the words that now may the words that I say and the words that you hear in your hearts be acceptable in God's sight. Lord is much better at pushing this button than I am. So uh, I apologize for some of the glitches on hymns and things. Trinity Sunday is a difficult one for, well, actually, I suggested that Jim Hanna was away because he didn't want to preach on Trinity Sunday. And it's partly because we have moved away in recent years from this imagery of God as Father. Um, and we've moved away from the imagery of God as Almighty, the one who who fixes everything and sets it all up for us. But Trinity Sunday is the one that comes after Pentecost, and it's been there for tradition for hundreds of years, the time in which we look at the Trinity as three persons. So this is the thing that so many other religions have real trouble with. Islam has Allah, one being. Judaism has Yahweh, one being. Christianity has three beings. God the Creator, God embodied in Jesus, and God as the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And other religions have trouble with this. As Jane said, the verse in the Bible that that gives us the Trinity. Go and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Had to have been written at least 70 years after it supposedly happened. And, I mean, it's really questionable. Did Jesus really say that? In all of the Gospels, there is no other reference anywhere to a trinity, to a three-part God. There is quite a bit of reference rest in the rest of the New Testament to people baptizing. Paul went and baptized. Philip baptized an Ethiopian in a ditch by the side of the road. Um, but there's no record of Jesus ever baptizing anybody. So why would he go and say to his disciples, go and do what I have done. Go and do what I have commanded. Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That formula has become almost universal. Many years ago when I served on a church committee, we learned that one of the ecumenical breakthroughs was that all churches, all the members of the World Council of Churches, now accept that if someone is baptized in what they call the triune name, the three names of God, Father, Son, Spirit, that person is legitimately baptized. It doesn't matter whether it was done by sprinkling on a baby, by immersion as an adult, it doesn't matter whether it was done by somebody who is ordained as a priest or one of you. If somebody says, I wish to be baptized, you can do it. And it's legitimate. As long as you do it with water and with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's acceptable anywhere in the world. One of the books that I was looking up to find out about the Trinity said that it was an act of genius because it says that God is not one entity somewhere way out there. It says that God is community. 
God does not happen by, I'll use the male pronoun, God does not happen by himself. God happens as all of us. Because we are fathers and mothers. We are sons and daughters. We have a spirit that moves us and motivates us. That's how the Trinity gets expressed. You may also have noticed in the verse that Jane read that when they met Jesus on the hillside in Galilee, some of them um, worshipped him and some of them didn't know how to worship him. And um, I guess my, one of the points that I'm saying, and one of the reasons that I chose that hymn, Jesus Loves Me, is because of that refrain, for the Bible tells me so. We assume that the Bible provides us with authority for everything that we do. The Bible doesn't tell us how to worship. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say that when you worship, you shall do it this way. We know some of the things that people did in worship. In the early church, yes, they gathered and they, they had the supper together. They baptized, lots of references to baptism. And they had preaching. There's one story that Paul preached so long, he talked right through the night and a young man named Eutychus was sitting in a window listening to him and he fell asleep and fell out onto the pavement outside. Hit his head and Paul had to revive him. One of those things where those who have the Spirit of God are able to bring people back again. Jesus did it, Peter did it, Paul did it. But there's nothing that tells us how they put it together. What we have in worship, what we are doing together this morning, is not in the Bible. It is something that has grown up. And so I'm going to move into something that I might call Worship 101. An introduction to how our worship patterns developed and what they stand for. It's not a magical rite. It's not something that only a few people know about. So let's see what comes up. Oh, that's fairly small. I'm sorry about that. Margaret warned me. <laughs> it's not that small. But it says proclamation, a scripture verse. That was how we usually started worship, you remember? Somebody stood up at the front and said, the Lord is in his holy temple, or words to that effect. And then we moved into a prayer of approach when we asked God to be with us. And then we went into a prayer of confession where we said we're not really worthy to come into your presence, but we'd like to anyway. And whoever was in charge gave an assurance of pardon which said it's okay, even if you're sinners, you can come. And then we had scripture readings and a sermon, just what we're doing. And then we went into prayers of intercession when we asked God to do what we wanted, what we hoped would happen for people in need. And we presented our offering. And finally we closed with a commissioning and benediction that sent people out. In the years when I was active in uh, the church press, we had conventions every year, and we always had worship led by a different faith group. And what amazed me was that although um, evangelicals had trouble dealing with Catholics, and the Catholics had deep divisions from the Orthodox churches of the East, they all followed pretty much this pattern. Now in the United Church, we added something different. Uh, a friend once said that United Church worship is a hymn sandwich. That is, between each one of those elements, we stuck in a hymn. 
So the first one was almost always holy, holy, holy. Elaine says that in all the years that she played piano and holy, holy, holy was always the first hymn, you never had to announce it. You just hit a chord, everybody stood up and they started singing. <laughs> and so we put in hymns all the way through. That's the hymn sandwich, you see. <clears throat> Where did that come from? As I say, it's not in the Bible. As I look at it, I think this comes from the traditions of going into not the holy place, but the place where the king was. The king, the monarch, the ruler, the person of absolute power. And so instead of scripture verses, you got a fanfare of trumpets or somebody announcing, all rise, the king is coming. And the people dutifully applauded and cheered and welcomed the king. And then if you wanted to actually speak to the king, you groveled. You came in looking down at your feet. You crawled in on the ground. You didn't look up. You weren't worthy of actually talking to the king. In some of the Middle Eastern places where the kings were all powerful, you kept your face down to the ground because if you looked up before you were given permission, that terrible swift sword came down and you were going to spend the rest of your life carrying your head around under your arm. Yes, Margaret, like Anne Boleyn. <laughs> And then the king gave you permission to rise. The king gave you permission to be present. Now there probably was a time when the king laid out the rules of what was going to happen. These are my decisions. This is what I expect from you. And then perhaps you had a chance to plead your case. Could you make an exception to that rule? Could you let my sheep graze on the public land? Could you perhaps lay your hands on my sister and give her help again? Because people believed kings, monarchs, tyrants had that power. And sometimes you had to say to the king, if you will do this, I will do so and so. I will pay you. I will put into your treasury 50 gold pieces. I will obey your rules. And then finally, you were sent out. And if you were lucky, you were still alive. You see how that parallels the process, our, our worship pattern? We come in treating God as the Almighty before whom we have to grovel. It's not surprising that our patterns of worship have changed a bit. And I know you can't read that second column very well, but if you look at your bulletin, it's all there. We come in and instead of groveling, we build some community by gathering, talking about why we are here, and singing together. And singing is a really powerful element of that. And then we take a middle section where we listen for what God might be intending for us. And then, finally, we respond to what we think God expects of us. And we go out. Of course, if you were if you were in a Roman Catholic or a Lutheran church, we would put at the end of this, at every service, some form of the Last Supper. Mass, Eucharist, Communion. We, don't, we do that sometimes. What we do every time is that we have coffee, tea, and goodies at the end of the service. <laughs> 
And I think that is just as much a part of the worship service as anything that's in the white above it. I think it's an essential element of what we are doing. That's what we build. The pattern of our worship, in other words, is not a biblical thing. It's something that comes to us out of our experience as humans. And we take that and we, we lift it up, we raise it in worship. So that it draws us closer to God. This is a different form, but notice the pattern that it follows. Come in, make yourself comfortable. This is a dinner party. You come in, you make yourself comfortable. You have a drink or an appetizer, you catch up on news, you share a meal. Then you get into deeper conversation, which sometimes goes until quite late at night, and finally you go home. That's a possible pattern for worship. Some of you, Julie's out, I can't remember. Margaret, you were in that workshop with um, uh, McInnes, uh, yes. where we wrote some songs mm -hmm. and things. And it worked better here than it did anywhere else because we followed that pattern. We came in, we talked to each other, we had supper together, we got all the barriers down, and then when we got around to exploring our faith in the poems that we wrote, it was powerful stuff. And then it was closure, and we went home. What do you think that worship pattern is? That's a yard sale. <laughs> <laughs> Arrive, work together, have conversations in small groups, and at the end of it, well, in a yard sale, you evaluate what you've accomplished by counting the money. In other kinds of things, for example, in retreats, we evaluate how well did this process work? What did we learn from it? And then we go home. Okay, here's another challenge. Arrive. Identify your goals for the day. Spend the next three hours trying to achieve them, and you celebrate when you do, and you lament when you don't. Actually, you curse when you don't, but that's okay. <laughs> then you gather for a meal or a drink together. You promise each other that you'll do better next time, and you go home. Any ideas? That comes out of a comment attributed to Bob Barton at his service here. He said, I think he said, I'd rather be on the golf course thinking about God than sitting in a worship service thinking about golf. <laughs> That's a golf game. <coughs> you greet each other. You decide, today I'm going to beat my handicap. And then you go out there and you try to do it. And then you gather at the 19th hole to talk about how you did and how many lies you had to make to get that score. And you commit yourself to improving. And you go home. See, these are all cultural patterns that we could bring in. And one of these goes to black. Uh, I think. That, one. Uh, yeah. um, that, that we could incorporate into worship. There is no magic formula. The only criterion is, will this bring people closer to God? Will this bring a deeper relationship? <clears throat> About three weeks, four weeks ago, I mentioned that uh, we needed people to take worship services for five Sundays during the summer. And I suspect that some of you said, no, I can't do that. That's a specialized function. Only a few people know how to lead worship. No, it's not. Worship is something that we do to bring each other closer to God. 
And so the question really for you as you as we get ready for music of meditation and trans transition into the rest of the service. If you were going to design a one hour experience that brought people closer to God, what would you do? How would you do it? What in your life enhances community that we could express here in a worship service? What would you do? <laughs> 